Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today's video was sent to me by Arthur Shamnin Shamni Arthur Shamni Shamne. Arthur S. sent me this video, and it features a guy named Pastor Jason who is offering up proof for Jesus' resurrection. For argument's sake for most of this video, I will start with the assumption that Jesus was a real person and really was crucified by the Romans. If I depart from this assumption, I will let you know at that time. So on to the video! Is there proof of the resurrection of Jesus? Short answer, no. Okay, let me make this quick. If the resurrection really happened, then it proves that yes, there is life beyond the grave. Life beyond death. Not in the slightest. If someone comes back from the dead, it does not do anything to prove that they were somehow alive but in spirit form while they were dead. It just demonstrates that death isn't necessarily as permanent as we had previously thought. And also, it also proves that Jesus is who he claimed to be, the Son of God. Wrong again. If you could conclusively demonstrate that Jesus did actually come back from the dead, that would be a step in the direction of proving that he is the Son of God, but really all it would prove is that our concept of death needs a reworking. I mean, even according to the Bible, there were other people that came back from the dead that were not the divine Son of God. Elijah and Elisha both brought young boys back to life by lying down on top of their dead bodies. Because when my child dies, I totally want a creepy old guy to want some alone time with the body to lie on top of it with his mouth on the child's mouth until the flesh becomes warm. Ugh. Ugh. Then of course there's Lazarus, and Jairus' daughter, and Tabitha, and the mob of zombies that invaded Jerusalem, and others that I'm not mentioning here. Are all of these people a bunch of God Juniors? If not, then how does Jesus coming back to life prove that he is? Christians eagerly claim, the tomb is empty, but that don't prove nothing. You're absolutely right. Something not being where it is expected to be is not proof of supernatural intervention. Fellow YouTuber Shannon Q once could not for the life of her find her glasses. After searching for an hour, she found them in the fridge. Is that proof of the glasses gremlin that moves your glasses from their proper resting place to absurdly ridiculous places? I would argue, no, it is not. First of all, how do you know it was Jesus' tomb? What if it was a wrong tomb? Hey, it's empty! I mean, it's possible, I guess. Maybe Joseph of Arimathea had multiple tombs, and knowing the controversy surrounding Jesus' death purposely misled people about which tomb he was buried in. Not entirely plausible, I'll admit, but infinitely more likely than a dead guy coming back to life. I mean, we know that people can own tombs while alive. And it is possible for one person to own multiple tombs, and sometimes people lie to other people. These are all things that are known to be possible. But so far, we have zero confirmed cases of dead people coming back to life. Like actual dead people, not heart stopped on the operating table for a couple minutes dead people. So either an implausible and unlikely but definitely possible explanation, or something that has never been demonstrated to be possible. Okay, the religious leaders who put Jesus on the cross, they would make sure that Jesus was dead. Would they though? I mean, according to the Gospels, they were there insulting him, but crucifixion normally takes several days. Would they really have someone there to check Jesus' pulse when he came down? Maybe. Maybe not. Not really sure what the religious leaders checking if he were alive or not has to do with Joseph of Arimathea taking him to a different tomb. Oh, and did I mention that the Bible makes it clear that Joseph of Arimathea is one of the religious leaders? Perhaps he was the one who reported back that Jesus was indeed dead. No way they would get the wrong tomb! Or, going back to the Joseph had multiple tombs idea, if he were the guy who reported on Jesus' death, he could also have been the guy who told them which tomb Jesus was in. They'd have no reason to suspect him, as also according to the Bible, Joseph of Arimathea was a prominent member of the council. And the council all agreed unanimously that Jesus was worthy of death according to Mark 14.63, meaning that Joseph was there, agreeing that Jesus should be crucified. Now for clarity, I don't actually think this is what happened. It's more likely that if Jesus was a real person and really was crucified, he would have been put into a mass grave by the Romans. The disciples probably would have been upset about not having the body of their Lord, and as the story grew over time, the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea was added on. Because that's how stories work. 
If you read the books of the New Testament in the order in which they were written, it is quite clear that the story grew with every retelling, with Jesus starting out as Paul's hallucination on the road to Damascus and never spoken about as if he were a physical living person, to Mark's real guy but not a very miraculous guy, to Matthew and Luke's plagiarism of Mark but with extra supernatural details mixed in, to John's badass Jesus who kicks butt wherever he goes, boldly asserts his divinity in a way that would have had anyone else stoned to death immediately, and orders people around while he's in the process of being executed. And when the rumor went out that Jesus is alive, well then go to the right tomb and get the body out. Rumor destroyed. This is actually a point against the empty tomb. If there really was an empty tomb that either the religious leaders or the Romans wanted kept secret, they could easily have just stashed another body in there and claimed that that was Jesus. The fact that nobody even tried that either says that this Jesus guy wasn't actually that big a deal to the Romans or the religious leaders of the time, or that there was no empty tomb in the first place and it was just a story. But at the correct tomb, the body wasn't there. According to books that were written by people 30 years later whose a priori beliefs required them to believe that Jesus was risen from the dead. So not like the authors could have just taken a stroll out and actually verified it. Well, obviously you might say, the body was stolen. But who would steal the body? The Romans? No, they were the ones protecting the tomb. And their life was at stake in protecting it. Unless the soldiers themselves were under orders from Pilate to steal the body, in which case they would definitely not be executed by Pilate for the theft. Also, a stolen Jesus would cause a riot, and the Romans want to keep the peace. That's an interesting assertion. Now, if a stolen Jesus would cause a riot, then why did the missing body not cause a riot? And who would have rioted? According to the Bible, everyone in the city wanted Jesus dead. If his body went missing, I think most people would just think, good riddance, now those crazy people who followed him don't have a burial site to worship at. In fact, with how angry the Bible says everyone in Jerusalem was at Jesus, I would think that a prime candidate for stealing the body would have been one of the random people in the crowd shouting for his death, someone who would steal the body as a final insult to Jesus' followers. Jesus' enemies? No, they're the ones who wanted Jesus dead and stay dead. Even if they wanted to desecrate the body, once rumors spread that Jesus was alive, dude, bring the body back. A dead Jesus is better than a missing Jesus. Yeah, I got no problem with that. I don't think the religious leaders would have stolen his body. There's not much in the way of motivation for them. That brings us to the obvious choice. The disciples. They stole the body to start a new religion. I could see the disciples wanting to steal his body for one reason or another. And according to Luke chapter 10, there were at least 72 disciples. So it stands to reason that it's possible that a few of them could have stolen the body without the other's knowledge. Not necessarily with the goal of starting a new religion, but perhaps they just wanted to bury Jesus themselves. Or maybe they just wanted to clear his name, as a missing body would mean that Jesus was taken bodily up into heaven like Elijah, which would serve as proof to the religious leaders that Jesus was actually a prophet of God. Or maybe some of them did want to fake a resurrection. They wouldn't have been the first or the last people to use deception to gain religious followers. Now, of course, since there were 72 disciples, it's quite possible that some of them somehow managed to pull this off and managed to fool the remaining disciples, which then negates the point that I'm sure you're going to bring up about them dying for a lie. If this were the case, they didn't necessarily know that it was a lie. But we'll talk more about that when you inevitably bring it up. Really? There's only one way anyone can steal the body. There's only one entrance and it's guarded by a Roman guard of 16 men. According to books that were written by people who weren't there 30 to 80 years after the events supposedly took place. Even if I grant the Joseph of Arimathea story and say that Jesus was actually in a tomb rather than in a mass grave with criminals, why would the Romans bother posting a guard? The Jewish council requested it of Pilate, but according to any sources that are not in the Bible, Pilate was rather ruthless towards the Jews. He would purposely do things to annoy them. For instance, he once set up gold-plated shields in Jerusalem, ostensibly to honor Tiberius, but according to Philo of Alexandria, it was more to annoy the Jews. The Jews petitioned Pilate to remove them, but he did not. Eventually, they managed to petition Tiberius himself, and Tiberius reprimanded Pilate for committing such a violation of precedent and ordered the shields removed. Pilate also once used funds from the Jewish temple to construct an aqueduct, and when addressing the crowd about it, had soldiers in the crowd beat and kill people randomly if there were any protest. Pilate was the kind of man that if the Jews asked him for something, he was likely to do the opposite out of spite. Which brings to mind another hypothesis which I touched on earlier. Perhaps Pilate provided the guard, and gave them orders to move the body just to mess with the Jews. That fits Pilate's character perfectly. What does he care if some new small religion forms as a result? That would be even more insulting to the Jews, so all the better. 
who would take turns doing four four-hour watches so they're awake around the clock. Meaning that if they were under Pilate's orders to move Jesus' body, they had plenty of time and the perfect opportunity to do so. And the Roman guard was the strongest unit in the known world. They didn't care about Jesus, of course, but they cared about the Roman seal that was placed over the tomb. And according to Roman law, the penalty for leaving their post was death. Sleeping on the job was death. They were ruthless and disciplined, and the disciples are going to attack these hardened soldiers. Which then makes Matthew 28 verses 11 through 13 all the more confusing. The guards are reporting to the chief priests? Why? And they tell them to say that the body was stolen while they were asleep. So the priests, who Pilate hates and goes out of his way to piss off, managed to bribe Roman guards to say that they were asleep at their post, which is punishable by death. But then the priests promise to keep the Roman guards out of trouble if Pilate finds out about it? Not bloody likely. And I would like to point out here that the phrasing used in the book of Matthew never actually makes it clear that the guard is indeed a Roman guard. When they ask Pilate for a guard, his response is, you have a guard, which could mean that he's giving them a guard, but could also be him essentially saying, you have your own guard, why are you asking me? Which would make the guard at the tomb a Jewish guard rather than a Roman guard, which also explains why they would report to the chief priests rather than to the Romans, and at the same time makes it more plausible that the guards would have been asleep on the job, allowing someone else to steal the body. This also makes more sense to the Christian narrative. The priests actually would be able to protect a Jewish guard from Roman retribution. If Pilate were actually upset about Jesus' missing body for whatever reason, they'd be able to placate him by saying that they did ask him for a Roman guard, knowing that their men weren't up to the task, so they could you know, throw a little bit of flattery in there. We know your guys are so awesome and our guys just weren't up to it. It might not work, knowing Pilate's character, but it had a much better chance of working than the Jewish priest being able to protect a Roman guard from the Roman governor. Also, the whole guard thing was an addition by the author of Matthew. It seems that that was his apologetic response to the claim of a stolen body. It is not mentioned in any of the other Gospels, except the apocryphal Gospel of Peter. The book of Matthew is often a verbatim copy of the book of Mark, except it occasionally seeks to correct errors made by the author of Mark and to present apologetic responses to problems with the book of Mark. I'm going to skip a bit now because he talks about the coma theory where Jesus basically passed out on the cross and woke up three days later without actually dying. I don't put much stock in this one, as if his injuries were as described in the Bible, then even if he were alive when he was taken off the cross, he probably would have died of his wounds from spending three days with no medical treatment, food, or water. Of course, if his wounds were not as bad as the Bible makes them out to be, and he really did just spend a few hours on the cross, it is slightly possible, but still not really plausible. I mean, still more plausible than actually dying and resurrecting, but there's not enough plausibility there for me to waste time defending it. And it wasn't some hallucination or some pretender look-alike. Jesus was around for 40 days after he resurrected. None of the Gospels actually specify a time frame. Acts chapter 1 verse 3 does say he stayed 40 days, and Acts is traditionally believed to have been written by the same person who wrote Luke, though there is some dissent among scholars on this point. And I would tend to place the length of time of Jesus' stay on earth after resurrecting as one of the points against Luke and Acts sharing an author, because in the book of Luke, it looks like Jesus stuck around for two or three days at most. He meets the people on the road to Emmaus, they mention that this was on the third day after the crucifixion, so it's the first day of Jesus being back. Then when they get to Emmaus, Jesus does his disappearing act in front of them, they get excited and go back to Jerusalem, which we've established takes about a day. Really, Emmaus is only about 10 to 12 kilometers away from Jerusalem, so walking at a pace of one meter per second, which is slower than average, it would take about three and a half hours to walk it. So assuming they stayed overnight in Emmaus, which is not clear in the Bible, it actually makes it look like they just turned around and headed straight back after dinner, but assuming they stayed overnight, they probably got to Jerusalem around noon. Jesus then had a short conversation with them before leading them out to Bethany, which is three kilometers away from Jerusalem, so less than an hour's walk. He then ascends into heaven. So looking at Luke chronologically, it looks like he stuck around for one to two days. The additional ending on the book of Mark makes it look like he didn't stay around for long at all, but it does use a bunch of vague terms like later and afterward, so I suppose you can stretch that out to mean 40 days if you really try. The book of Matthew doesn't even have an ascension, it just ends with the Great Commission and the line, and behold, I am with you always to the end of the age, which makes it sound like he didn't even go back to heaven. And John is a book that has him sticking around for long enough that it could very easily be imagined to be at least 40 days. 
I like the ending of the Book of John because it reminds me of the never-ending story. Jesus did many other things as well. If every one of them were written down, I suppose that even the whole world would not have room for the books that would be written. Sounds a lot like, but that is another story and shall be told another time. And there were more than 500 witnesses who saw him. 500 witnesses that are unnamed. So go ask these 500 witnesses what they saw, but I'm not going to tell you who they are. Oh yeah, and remember the last two weeks where I went into very small detail about how our brains work in two very limited scenarios, where it lies to you when you try to remember events, and where it actively works to make things look like what it decided those things should be, even if it's wrong about what those things are? Now, 1 Corinthians, where the 500 witnesses claim comes from, was written only 20 years after Jesus' death, but had 20 years of witnesses remembering things wrong that they perceived wrong in the first place, and even if you did find 500 people that agree they saw Jesus alive and well, how reliable is their account when we know that witness accounts get messed up starting the moment the witnessed event took place? I'm not saying they all hallucinated the same thing at the same time, but I could easily find more than 500 people alive today who claim to have seen Elvis still alive. What makes those people wrong but the 500 of 1 Corinthians right? 40 days to examine whether this was truly the risen Jesus. Even if he did stick around for 40 days, that is hardly enough time for a proper scientific examination to determine conclusively that it was actually Jesus back from the dead. And that's with modern technology. Imagine with the technology back then. And, I mean, people that knew him well were walking on the road with him for hours, talking the whole way, and they didn't recognize him until he broke the bread at dinner time. And you want me to trust these same people who say that it was definitely him, there's no possible way they could have been mistaken when they were mistaken for an entire afternoon with the guy? And as the disciples were preaching, they would say, If you don't believe me, ask one of the many witnesses that are still around. One of the many witnesses, most of whom were not named. Some of whom didn't even recognize the guy while having a long conversation with him. And keep in mind that the 500 witnesses bit was written in a letter to a church in Corinth, some 2,000 kilometers away from Jerusalem. So yeah, if you don't believe me, go talk to one of the 500 who are still alive. It'll only take you two weeks to walk there if you don't stop to rest or sleep. Vacation time was a thing in ancient Greece, right? And everybody got at least a month's vacation in order to investigate claims like this, right? Except if you take sleeping and eating into consideration, it actually takes about 30 days to walk it. And then you'd need some time in Jerusalem to track down the witnesses, so you'd need at least two and a half months off of work in order to investigate this claim. I don't know anyone that gets that kind of vacation time now, much less in the ancient world where there weren't labor laws and unions lobbying for vacation time. I'm skipping another bit because he talks about how they found an iron rod in the stone at the supposed tomb of Jesus. That's nice, but all that proves is that at some point there was an iron rod driven into the stone there. Maybe it was even for a tomb seal, but that doesn't prove that it was Jesus' tomb. I will show a bit at the end though, because I think it's funny. You see, when the angel rolled the stone away, this iron rod was sheared off, and the remaining portion is still there today. Why else would an iron rod be sheared off? <laughs> yeah, I, I can't think of any other way a thin piece of iron sitting exposed to the elements for 2,000 years could possibly have been damaged. It couldn't possibly have been anything other than an angel rolling a stone past it. It's not like iron rusts or anything when left exposed, right? Lastly, let's say somehow the disciples stole the body. Somehow the disciples made it all up and the real body wasn't produced by the Romans. So they make up a new religion for money, fame, tax evasion. I have never seen anyone claim that. If the disciples stole the body, it was likely not with the intention of getting rich off of a fake religion. As I pointed out earlier, it could have been as simple as just wanting to bury Jesus themselves. And with how many disciples there were, it is possible that the ones who stole the body didn't tell the others, and since Jesus said he would rise, the others then assumed that he had. It's not hard to imagine why the body snatchers wouldn't share that they had stolen the body. They knew the other disciples would disapprove of such action. The Bible makes it quite clear several times that the disciples were not a cohesive group that agreed on everything. In fact, a good chunk of the New Testament is Paul writing letters to different churches specifically to disagree with what those churches were practicing and teaching. So there was dissent right from the get-go. Actually, each one of the disciples died poor, and they were killed for their faith. Each and every one? I'd like to see your sources for that. 
The Bible only mentions two disciples' deaths, Judas, who either hangs himself or trips and falls on some rocks, depending on which book you're reading, and James the brother of John, who was killed by Herod, but the Bible doesn't mention anything about him being offered his life in return for renouncing a belief in Jesus. And for most of the others, the stories of their deaths come from books that are considered apocryphal. In other words, the various churches don't accept the claims that these books make, but they accept the stories of the disciples' martyrdom. For instance, the Acts of Andrew is the book where we get the information about Andrew's cross-shaped crucifixion, but in verse 25 has Andrew basically aborting an illegitimate child, and in verse 9 has him defeating enemy soldiers simply by crossing himself. So why do we get to believe that the book is telling the truth about Andrew's death, but not about him using his god powers to perform abortions or defeating armies with a single gesture? And as a side note, I often point out how unreliable the Gospels are because they were written a minimum of 30 years after the events that they describe, and since even Christian scholars will agree that they were not authored by eyewitnesses of the events, they are at best a second-hand account of events that happened 30 years previous being recalled from memory. Compared to our sources for the other apostles' death, 30 years is nothing. The Acts of Andrew is from the 2nd century, and it's one of the closest to the supposed events of any of the other sources. Acts of Philip was authored in the 4th century, but it doesn't even have Philip dying in defense of the resurrection, it has him defending himself when Jesus rebuked him, so Jesus declares that he would die in glory and then spend 40 days after death being tortured, before finally being led into heaven. Some of the sources for the disciples' deaths weren't written until the 14th century, more than a thousand years after the fact. I could go on, but anyone who has seen all my videos will know that this is the point where I just drop a link to Apologia's video in which he goes through all the church tradition deaths of the disciples. He goes through all 12 of them, and I highly recommend it. You would think, if they made it all up, that at least one of them would crack. At least one of them would say, hell no, I ain't dying for a lie. And of the 72 mostly unnamed disciples, it is quite possible that a number of them did, but we just haven't heard about it. Christians are getting jailed, killed, and not one of them said, we made it all up, don't kill me! How many times did Joseph Smith move the Mormons to another state to avoid both social persecution and legal prosecution? At least three times, and then they took off to Utah after Joseph died. He was killed as a direct result of his religious claims, and he never once admitted that he made it all up. Granted, the angry mob that shot him didn't exactly give him a choice to live if he recanted, but that doesn't seem to dissuade you from saying that James counts as one of your why-would-they-die-for-a-lie examples when the Bible simply says that he was executed, and makes no mention of him getting a chance to live if he recants. And we have better sources for the death of Joseph Smith than for any of the disciples. So if this argument is as solid as you seem to think it is, you should be Mormon. Jesus did rise from the dead, and logically, there's no other explanation. I have provided several alternate explanations, most of which centered around the assumption that Jesus actually did get a special tomb all to himself with Roman soldiers guarding it, which is incredibly unlikely. And I grant that many of my explanations are not entirely plausible, but one thing they all have in common is this. They are infinitely more plausible than a guy actually coming back from the dead. But if Jesus actually existed and was crucified by the Romans, I maintain that the most probable fate of his body was to be thrown in a mass grave along with the two guys that were crucified with him. The fact that the earliest books of the Bible to be written don't make any mention of the tomb bears this out. It reads very much like a story that grew as it was passed down, and I've been given no compelling reason to think otherwise. That's it for this video, but I'm not quite done. I'm starting a new bit at the end of my videos where I'll give a short reply to a comment that you guys leave. So for today, I have chosen Michael Gold's comment. I like your approach, but isn't it kind of shooting fish in a barrel? Guys like this make no logical sense and can't be reasoned with, so what's the point? For context, this was posted on my video responding to Jason Lyle, where he claims that the Bible has to be your foundation in order to use logic. Well, my point isn't to deconvert Jason Lyle. I know that's probably not going to happen, and if it ever does, it will probably not be because of me. I respond to videos for the people who watch the videos, people who are like I was when I started questioning my faith, people who need to know that it's okay not to believe, and that they are going through a transition that others have gone through as well. The people making the loudest arguments in the comments are essentially me from 10 years ago, and I am here making videos against my former position, so I am proof that even the most stubborn minds can be changed. 
I also make my videos for Christians, people who might not be sure whether a literal interpretation of Genesis actually lines up with science. I get messages from Christians fairly regularly who appreciate what I do because they think that young earth creationists make the rest of Christianity look bad. So my goal is not to deconvert the people whose videos I respond to, but rather to essentially give context to the snippets of science that creationists cherry pick to make it look like their view is the scientific one. And I realize that I'm saying this at the end of a video that had absolutely nothing to do with young earth creationism, but I also like to examine arguments that may seem good on the surface to see if they actually hold up to scrutiny. And that's it for today, leave a comment and I may respond to it in a future video, and for a fun drinking game watch this video again and do a shot every time I say plausible. One last thing, the new intro and outro were generously created for me by the YouTube channel The Storm Cometh. They're a lot better than that thing that I cobbled together myself, so go check that channel out, link in the description. Remember to follow me on Twitter and support me on Patreon. See you next time! <laughs>